thanks to Thousand for the introduction. And uh, I'm Hong Sui Zhu from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm going to talk about the characterization of the elastic constant of the CTGS crystal at high temperatures by the uh, antenna transmission acoustic resonance method. So first of all, I want to talk about the why, why do we focus on this work? And the first question, why do we study the high temperature sensors? Uh, that's because the high performance high temperature sensors are highly demanded in many, uh, in many high temperature related industries. For example, uh, in the fossil fuel and the nuclear power plants area, you know, it is a, a must to detect the ambient temperature and the composition of the exhaust gases. So uh, usually in this in this area, the working temperature is, is under the high temperatures. So the sensors used here to detect the temperature and the gas should be able to work quite stably uh, under the working temperature. And uh, for another uh, example, in the automobile industry, uh, it is quite uh, meaningful to achieve the real-time monitoring of the viscosity of the engine oil to determine when to change the oil. So also here, the sensors should be able to work rel reliably uh, uh, under the working temperature of the running engine. So this is why we study the high temperature sensors. And uh, the second question is, why do we choose the CTGS crystal? The CTGS crystal is one of the Langside family crystals. And you know, the Langside family crystals have been widely investigated for the high temperature applications. That's because there is no or phase transition prior to their melting point. So right here, uh, this figure shows the usage temperature range for for this commonly used uh, high temperature material. And the, the rectangular thing in red mean the melting point or the phase transition point of the of this material. And the the blue one shows the projected usage temperature for the materials. So as we can see here, the Langesite and the Oxbury crystals possess the highest uh, melting point. Uh, and at, at the current stage of, of our work, we focus on the Langesite crystals. And in the future, we will be more attention to the Oxbury crystals. That's because the symmetry of the Oxbury crystal is much lower than the Langesite crystal. So let's come back to the Langesite crystal. Uh, its melting point is this high, about uh, 1,500 degrees C. However, if the usage temperature is restricted to about uh, 800 degrees, that's because uh, above this uh, temperature level, the its resistivity is too too small. However, compared to the Langsat crystal, the CTGS crystals possess higher resistivity. As shown here, this is the is the resistivity for Langesite, and this, this is for the CTGS. So you can see here, uh, the res resistivity of a CTGS crystal is about uh, two to three orders higher than the Langesite crystal. So this is why we use the CTGS crystal. And the, the last question in this part, why do we use the ATR, uh, ATR method? You know, they commonly use the resonance method uh, to determine the elastic constants are the IEEE dynamic method and the the, uh, the IUF method. However, both of these methods have their uh, disadvantages. For the IEEE dynamic method, the firstly, if you want to apply this method, the electrodes and the Y connections are necessary. So this will introduce the method and the force loadings, which will reduce a little bit about the uh, accuracy of the result. And uh, secondly, uh, through this method, uh, many different uh, kinds of samples with, with the different orientations are needed. Uh, actually, at the beginning of this year, we we tried this method to determine the elastic constants of CTGS, and uh, here is the design. Here is our design. You can see here, totally seven different kinds of samples are needed, and uh, each of them should be tested individually from the room temperature to the high temperature. So this process is quite time consuming. 
the IOS method could uh, avoid uh, the time consuming issue about uh, 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 of the actually dynamic method because so the IOS method only one sample is needed. However, for, for the IOS method, the samples are held by two transducers. As shown in this diagram, this is a sample. Here are the two transducers. So this will also introduce the, the force, which will, which will make the sample couldn't vibrate freely. And the fatal problem for this, for this method is the, the transducers used here usually cannot be used on a high temperature. So this restricts the usual temperature of this method. And, uh, let's look at how the how does the ATR method work. The ATR method uh, bases on the IOS method, and they only differ in the measurement system setup. So this diagram shows the uh, system setup of ATR method. Let's look at uh, this part. Instead of uh, uh, clapping the sample by two transducers. We put the sample in in a, uh, in an uh, antenna tube. The antenna tube consists of three three ones: the driving one, the ground one, and the detecting one. So the the inside dimensions of the tube are slightly larger than the sample, so the sample could uh, vibrate almost freely in this tube. And here is the working principle of this system: the the sound wave generated by the function generator here are uh, loaded between the drum one and the ground one. So at some certain uh, frequencies, the, the sample could resonate. And the resonance of the, sum, of the sample uh, could lead to the potential difference between the ground one and the detected one. So in this case, we can get the detected signal. Uh, and the detected signal is first amplified by the uh, power amplifier and then transfer it to the locking amplifier to fill out the interference signal. And then finally, the signal is read and recorded by the oscilloscope here. So if we sweep the uh, frequency of the drumming signals, we can, we can get the uh, frequency spectrum uh, of the sample. So this flowchart shows the experimental procedures for both the conventional IOS method and the method used in this work, uh, and they only differ uh, in the in the way of obtaining the projected resonant frequencies. So the first step here is uh, from the uh, system I just showed, we can get the measured frequency spectrum from the oscilloscope, and if we uh, fit the Lorentz function to each peak, we can get the ideal uh, rather than uh, frequency spectrum. The next step is to get the predicted resonance frequencies. In the conventional IOS, IOS method, the really risk method is applied to to get the predicted resonance frequencies. However, this method requires a, a lot of calculation. So to simplify this step in our work, we we use the elastic constants obtained from the actually dynamic method to predict this. So once you uh, once we have known the predict and uh, measure the uh, frequency frequencies, we can identify the vibration modes of a sample by minimizing the difference between the, uh, this, this two sets of uh, frequencies uh, in a least square fitting, and uh, finally we can calculate the, the elastic constants accordingly. So now let's look at some important results. So right here, this figure shows the uh, ideal uh, frequency spectrum for the sample at three different temperatures, the room temperature, the 400 degree, and the 800 degree. Uh, the measurement frequency range is from 25 to 725 kilohertz. And at this three different temperature points, so we get 18, 25, and 23 uh, resonant frequency peaks. Uh, you can see with the increase of the temperature, uh, most of the uh, frequency peaks decrease. Like this one, this one, uh, this one, this one. So uh, this is because the, both the mechanical loss and the, and the dielectric loss uh, increase with the temperature. And uh, here are the calculated results of the, all the 
uh, elastic constants and uh, and the bulk modular speed. So in, in the in the upper figure, we can see the the C one one three three one two four four and six six. They all decrease almost linearly with the temperature. And uh, the C one one three three, these two are related to the PU extensional vibration mode. So their values are, are, are the largest. And uh, as a comparison for the 4, 4, and 6, 6, these two, these two are related to the pure shear vibration mode. So they are, their values are much smaller and the, their temperature dependence is weaker. Another thing is the, the values of C33 is larger than C11. And according to the symmetry of the crystal, C11 equals to C22. So this indicates the, uh, the crystals are safer to deform along Z direction than the X and Y direction. So another thing is for, for the remaining two, two sets of uh, constants, uh, 1, 3 and 1, 4, uh, they all have the same change with the temperature. That's uh, probably because the, their vibration modes are too complex. So another important result is Compared to the uh, constants obtained from the Archival Heat Dynamic Method, most of the constants got from the ATR method uh, are larger. So this indicates that the, the mass loading and the force loading during the Archival Heat Dynamic Method measurement uh, will result in the smaller results. Uh, short conclusion here. Compared to the IOS method, the ATR method could, uh, could be applied on a high temperature. And uh, compared to the Archival Heat Dynamic method, the ATR method are a temp, oh, sorry. A time saving, and uh, it could uh, avoid the, the errors from the electrodes and the, the Y connection. And the, the mass and force loadings introduced during the measurement of the actual dynamic method will result in smaller results. And I want to thank all these guys' help for this work. Okay, thanks for your attention.